I did a PhD, uh, or I'm officially still doing a PhD at City University at the Center for Creativity, where I work with Sarah Jones, uh, who is also uh, doing a workshop here, and uh, amongst other people, Neil Maiden as well, you've seen earlier today. Um, Currently, I work as an assistant professor uh, at a small research university in the Netherlands called Tilburg University. Is that one? Uh, there, I specialize in uh, behavioral uh, sciences. Uh, currently, we're focusing, for instance, on uh, behavioral correlates of different types of daydreaming. So, for instance, if someone's fantasizing or um, uh, ruminating, we try to distinguish uh, between those type of things automatically based on uh, sensor data, for instance. Uh, another line of research, uh, which I did for my PhD and which I'm also still very active in, is about the relationship between different emotions and creative thinking. And that's what this talk is going to be about. What I'm especially interested in is uh, how different emotions might enhance or diminish creative loss <coughs> performance and how you can use and design new types of technologies to target that relationship between emotion and creativity. So today I want to discuss two uh, recent studies about the topic. It's a delay. <laughs> So, the two studies I want to discuss today, the idea behind these is that um, when you are part of a creative, pro where, when you are in a creative process, trying to come up with new and useful ideas, uh, you're also constantly evaluating these ideas, you're appraising your own ideas. And there's quite an interesting link between appraisals and emotions as well, so actually appraisals are the, uh, the most powerful cause of emotion. I'm not talking about appraisals for your job, for instance, which can also be a source of emotion, but literally small, quick, almost automatic appraisals about the quality of an idea, about whether you like it or not. It's really about that sort of thing. So before we go further, I think it's good to, uh, to come with some definitions, at least, uh, so you can get a kind of a broader perspective of, of these relationships between emotion and creativity. So, for instance, emotions have been defined as uh, responses to events that help you adapt to a particular situation. Typically, these events, they have some bearing on your own well-being. Uh, either they're about something that you want or something that you want to avoid, something like that, and about the implications of the outcomes of these types of events for your own well-being. And there's lots of theories about emotion, of course. So one popular one is the componential one, which you can see here. Um, this one states that uh, emotions uh, basically consist of different components that synchronize in response to uh, an event. And these uh, synchronized responses in these different components, they make up uh, this adaptive response. So for instance, uh, in this example, something happens, say uh, you see a nice piece of cake, and your appraisal is, ah, oh, that's nice, I'm hungry, that's something I want to eat. So that's your appraisal. That's where it starts, in this case, with kind of the interaction between this event and the way you appraise that event. Uh, when that happens, uh, different action tendencies emerge. So you want to approach that cake, you want to grab it, right? And of course, other <coughs> different things. So you might smile or you might salivate. So different expressions, physiological changes, dopamine release, for instance, in response to a prospective reward. And you might have positive feelings, at least as long as you're not on a diet, for instance. Otherwise, you might feel guilty. Um, <coughs> then if you look at creativity, of course, motivation is really important uh, uh, to creativity. Uh, without that, not much is going to happen. But there's also the creative process. And basically, people go through different information processing steps. So for instance, if you have defined a problem, you might try to come up with different concepts and combine these concepts based on which you can generate an idea. So for instance, if you have two concepts, two ideas, you know, maybe there's a combination possible between listening to music and jogging. You might come up with a world-changing idea of uh, running shoes with an MP3 player building. So, of course, that goes further, and then there's an evaluation bit. Is this idea really interesting? And that's actually the link <coughs> with appraisals again. And you might say, well, I haven't seen it very often, but it might not be very useful. It might not work due to other 
properties of this idea. Or it might, if you're very uh, positive about this type of things. So now that we have these two definitions, creativity you know, as kind of the processes that lead to uh, original and uh, effective ideas, and then the fact that emotion is basically an adaptive <coughs> response that changes the way you think and act, put these together, you can probably already infer that the link between emotion and creativity is really rooted in uh, how this adaptive change that associates with an emotion matches with, uh, say, what's necessary in a particular step in a creative process. So, for instance, ID evaluation usually benefits from a good focus, from a focus on the details, focus on whether your ideas are usefulness. But when you're generating ideas, it might be quite useful if you're thinking really flexibly. And that's where this adaptive response of positive emotions comes in. Positive emotions associate with cognitive flexibility. So that means that in quite a positive state, it's easier to switch uh, between different tasks. It's easier to access remote concepts, for instance, rather than focusing on, on very uh, tightly related concepts of your topic, of your design problem, for instance. So you can imagine there that if you think more flexibly, the likelihood of generating very original ideas uh, also goes up. And that's kind of uh, the way I want to uh, frame this talk further. It's really about this link between positive emotions, uh, flexibility, and creativity. So if you then go back to this story about appraisals, um, for example, what type of appraisals uh, calls positive emotions, you can look at the appraisal theory, for example, by Klaus Scheerder. Basically, these theories, they say that different combinations of appraisals and appraisal outcomes, they tend to make up similar emotional responses. So, for instance, if someone's angry, that's usually caused because something obstructs your goals, you have a problem, and that something is a person that's doing it. Uh, it's even worse when it's intentionally, right? Uh, Positive emotions uh, tend to be uh, elicited when uh, something happens that's conducive to your goals. You obtain a reward, for instance. Uh, you know, the stuff happens that you want. So what you see is that even though you can separate lots of different types of emotions based on these appraisal theories, uh, the distinction between simply positive and negative, rather than the distinction between sad and, and, and angry or fearful, for instance, is really just based on whether something is conducive to your goals or whether something obstructs your goals. Um, what then becomes the question, for example, during ID generation, is what are the things that are goal conducive or goal obstructive during ID generation? Well, we did some previous studies that were kind of unrelated to this, but we found some correlations there that actually showed that, well, it's probably that uh, during ID generation, generating original ideas and knowing that you generate original ideas uh, associates with positive emotions. So we assume, based on these correlations, uh, is that it might be the case that the appraisals that cause positive emotions during an ID generation process uh, is the appraisal of how original your own ideas are. So in other words, if you come up with original ideas, and obviously your goal during a ID generation process is to come up with original ideas, then actually doing that is kind of you know, satisfying your goals. So you end up feeling good about that during the ID generation process. So these are kind of these assumptions that go in there. The interesting bit is then that if um, flexibility leads to more original ideas or increases the likelihood of having more original ideas, and getting original ideas actually causes positive emotions, and then in turn, positive emotions causes more flexibility in thinking. So it's, it's kind of a weird feedback loop that reinforces itself. So coming up with good ideas makes you a bit happier during your process, but also actually make you do better, let's say. And we are quite interested in this. What if we then intervene with this using a prototype technology it actually makes you believe that you're doing quite well, that you're actually generating original ideas. So computational feedback, computer feedback while you're coming up with ideas, computer telling you that you're doing pretty good. So we would of, of course think that, well, if that's believable, that <coughs> if that works, then actually you might tap into this feedback loop. And if people then believe that uh, they're doing a bit better, they feel better about it, and then they start to actually do better as well during creative tasks. 
for this specific sort of thing. So we made a prototype interactive system using kind of off-the-shelf natural language processing technology. And the only thing that this interactive system does is that it already knows about a lot of ideas about a specific topic. So we collected, like from previous experiments, uh, a few thousand ideas. And then it looks at the, the concepts in that, uh, in all these ideas. And it simply counts how often certain concepts and combinations of concepts occur. So if you then type in an idea that uh, uh, would presumably be, be original, the system could actually uh, measure that by comparing your idea, the concepts in your idea, to this big data set of, of concepts from previous ideas that we already have. So if these concepts don't, are not very frequent, it's either that these ideas are very original, and then there's of course a limitation, or this idea is completely bizarre, and then it would also not happen very often. It's kind of a limitation. Yeah. Okay. Um, aside from that, you then also want to manipulate that feedback, and that's also something we did. And I don't want to go into that uh, too deeply, but we did an empirical study to kind of check how far we can go with making things more positive or negative, and what the system actually does, it either provides a feedback score on your ideas. So you type in an idea and it gives you a number, basically. And then it can manipulate that score, of course. It either provides you with something that people typically think would be appropriate, uh, an appropriate originality score for your idea, or it would make it slightly worse, but still believable, or slightly better, still believable. And kind of uh, making sure that it's not too positive or too negative that people stop believing. And that's what we tried to find out with the previous study. And the interface for the proof of concept system is really simple. It looks like this. You type in your idea. For example, you have a task. What you can you do with the brick? Uh, and you say, ah, I can build a house. And then compares the idea that you type in with uh, all the ideas that the system saw before. And said, well, a lot of people think you can build a house with a brick. That makes sense. So you get a very low feedback score, in this case of four. Of course, you can say, you know, maybe you can uh, use it to calculate volume. That's already quite original, I think. You get a way higher score. And it's these scores that the system also manipulates. So in some conditions, for instance, the same score for building a house would be lower than the four. You get zero, for instance. And in a very positive situation, you get even slightly higher score. So we did a small study. Uh, we measured positive and negative emotions via self-report. Uh, we asked people whether they felt very satisfied with their ideas or very frustrated during the idea generation process. And we used the estimates of the program itself to calculate the actual originality score. And if you look at the results, what we found is that actually there are positive correlations between originality and satisfaction, as you can see uh, here and a negative correlation between originality and frustration. I guess that's pretty straightforward, if that makes sense. So what that means is that uh, there's kind of a general relationship between these positive emotions and originality, which confirms some of our assumptions. Now, the study that we did was that uh, people did different ID generation tasks, and uh, during these tasks, uh, they would either try to come up with uh, original ideas for a brick and then for original ideas for using a paper clip, for instance. And in these different conditions, if you then compare these, we also did different uh, manipulations of the feedback. So sometimes someone do, was trying to come up with ideas for using a brick, but their feedback was manipulated negatively or it was manipulated in a way that it seemed to, to kind of match what they... Uh, what people generally think about that. Or it was made more positive. And what we see is something quite interesting, that yes, of course, if we make the scores for their ideas a bit more positive, they feel better, like you see here, uh, or they, they report more satisfaction. If it gets worse, uh, they report more frustration. And then you see a slight increase in the likelihood of generating an original idea as well. So actually, this whole assumption about uh, using kind of these these feedback on your ideas uh, seem to work. So providing people automatically even kind of a silly basic computer program with somewhat believable feedback about their ideas can actually manipulate the originality of their ideas as well. Excuse me. Yeah. Just to confirm that the last graph um, related to the first one, when, when the system um, sort of um, encouraged them by adding yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. So if the, if the feedback's more positive, you see slightly higher likelihoods of generating original ideas. It's a little bit, but still. Researchers, so I'm really happy that it worked. <laughs> <coughs> How much time do I still have? Uh, just a couple minutes. A couple minutes, okay. So, we did another study uh, using exactly the same uh, proof of concept system. And we figured, you know, if you do this over time, people get used to the feedback as well. That might be very important. So, you know, if you give people rewards, for instance, if you give your kid a piece of candy every, say, Wednesday, it starts to, in the beginning, it's really happy, your kid. He or she is really happy, so I'm not it. Um, but then after a few weeks, your child will start to expect getting that uh, candy. And then basically if it doesn't get it, he or she doesn't get it, it's you know, frustration. If he or she does get it, it's just as expected, nothing happens. And the same, we thought that maybe the same would be the case for, uh, for creative thinking as well as well, and receiving that feedback and those feedback manipulations. So say if uh, we would manipulate the feedback positively all the time, we'd actually expect that uh, at some point people stop responding to that uh, with positive emotions, because it's just expected. I always get good feedback. So, so it's really about the difference in expectations, where you're doing better or worse than you would expect. And we thought maybe we can manipulate that with the study as well. So we did that similar study, and what we did is actually people did two tasks following up on each other. So first, say, one ID generation task, and then the second one. And then the feedback they would receive in the two tasks would differ, uh, or would be the same. So either both would be, uh, in both cases, the feedback would be manipulated positively, or it would be manipulated negatively in the first task, and then positively in the second task. And in the latter case, for us that would mean that actually people would think that they, would, they did better than they would uh, expect, because first they became conditioned to the idea, well, you know, I'm doing pretty bad, but this is kind of, you know, this is the type of feedback I can expect. And then later on, getting better feedback, but that actually might actually generate more positive emotions. And just to check, uh, measuring expectations, we asked people, you know, uh, afterwards, did you feel that you did better or worse than you expected? And then the same as in the first study, we checked for satisfaction and frustration, as well as originality again uh, with the uh, machine scores. And there you see somewhat similar correlations, although a bit less pretty. We have a bunch of outliers here that kind of bias things a little bit, at least it looks like that. Uh, but then if we look at uh, the averages, for example, if we look at the originality scores here, get rid of that. So if we give positive feedback first, and then in the second task, we follow that by negative feedback, people tend to generate less original ideas. And when we compare that with the opposite, giving negative feedback in the first task, and then positive feedback in the second task. And you see a similar pattern kind of emerging for the satisfaction and the frustration scores. Although, what's quite interesting, for the expectation scores, we don't see that. We see that for negative feedback in the first task, followed by more positive feedback in the second task. People felt they did way better than expected. But if you give them positive feedback first and then negative feedback second, they kind of felt the same as if you would give them negative feedback all the time or positive feedback all the time, given their expectations. So we thought that was quite interesting. So apparently people didn't really uh, believe that uh, getting positive feedback first and negative feedback second would reflect on their own abilities, for instance. And I, I don't have that kind of on record, but what I heard basically while doing the experiments, that some people start in that condition, positive followed by negative feedback, start to say, you know, it's just the computer program that's wrong. <laughs> so, of course it's wrong, but still. But so apparently people are, you know, more likely to believe a computer program when it's telling you that you're doing really well than when it's telling you that you kind of suck at what you're doing. Uh, so that was kind of an interesting byproduct there. So what you see here is that really simple interventions uh, with computer programs providing you with feedback about how, how original your ideas are, finding ways to manipulate a feedback can actually give you quite some control over the relationship between positive emotions and creative thinking. Um, that's it. Well, thank you.